I should show the title screen at least. <laughs> okay, let's do this. The timer starts when I first move Mike, not when I select the file screen, so this time right here doesn't count. All right, in three, two, one, go. All right, so yeah, Star Tropics. If you've never seen this game before, then You've probably also been wondering, what's that one sprite in between Gradius and Zelda 2 Link on the bottom of the screen? Well, that's this guy. Mike Jones, high school baseball pitcher. Generic teenager, really. We're going to talk to this guy and get the most awesome weapon in all of video game history, the yo-yo. Basically, the plot is you're here on vacation to visit your uncle, but your uncle got abducted by somebody. The tunnel to the first dungeon in this game is blocked off by some guard, and he won't let you by until you talk to enough people in the village, so that's why I'm talking to some people and not talking to others. this lady. I always thought as a kid that she was holding a rubber chicken in her hand. Don't ask. That was, that was pretty weird as a kid. Alright, now we get to the real gameplay. So your yo-yo, the way it works is it works a lot like a real yo-yo, so as soon as it hits something, it comes right back to you. So a lot of times, I can't really show it here, but I'm gonna be waiting until I'm right next to an enemy before I hit them with the yo-yo. That way the yo-yo firing animation is shorter and I can get back to progressing a little bit faster. Like right here. That's faster than if I had tried to use the full range of my yo-yo there. And yeah, random tiles that spawn switches to doors is kind of was kind of the bane of my existence as a kid. The first time playing through this game, you're going to be jumping on every single tile like this room, oh my god. The first time playing through this room I remember very well. To try and find the one tile that works, and of course, you don't want to go left or right here through this magic door up top. So I just got the fire in that last room. Fire does double damage as the yo-yo, so it, but it, uh, the firing animation for it is longer. So for the rest of this dungeon, you're going to see me switching back and forth, depending on uh, which weapon is more appropriate. Oh, guys, guess what? Guys, guess what? McAfee just updated itself, and it has to restart in order to install the latest updates. Should I restart the computer now, or should I restart it later? And you know what's even better is that a little text box showing that has popped up, and it's covering the Twitch chat, so I can't see it anymore. Restart later, thank you. Wow, you've done it! The way the points in this game work, the points don't matter at all. But the way that they work is, there's like a base value. I think it's whatever 256 times 30 is. And you lose points for every enemy you kill. So basically, a pacifist run and a high score run would be the same thing. Alright, so we talked to Babu right there. He says to walk right on to our uncle's laboratory and hijack his submarine, so we'll go ahead and do that. ID code is 1492. That's, that's totally a safe password. That was a decent chapter one. Uh, I guess I got so busy yakking on about uh, McAfee that I forgot to mention that, that we skipped that snake boss there by damage boosting through him. 
that's actually the only skip or any kind of glitch that we're going to see in this game. This game is actually quite well built. Except for a possibility of glitching the ending of the game, but we'll get to that when we get there. So yeah, dolphins. This this is the bright green dolphin block, in case the, the stream title doesn't say that. World record is 105.21, and this run is so RNG heavy that that's not going to happen, so <laughs> put world record out of your minds immediately. So we find this random bottle on the beach that says our uncle is abducted by aliens, dun dun dun, oops. I'm pretty sure I was holding right to tell the game that I did not want to read the letter again, but it didn't listen, so... That bottle also contained like a secret code that lets us dive through these black wavy water bits. That's a heart container right down there, it does exactly what you would expect. But of course it takes way too much time to grab those, so we will not be grabbing any heart containers this run. More examples of waiting to the last minute to shorten the yo-yo animation. Most of the enemies we've seen so far have had pretty fixed patterns. These guys right here, if they would show up on screen, there they are, are a bit more random. You notice how they're always facing right or left, but that doesn't mean they're going to move right or left. The way that it works is, if they're facing right, they're going to move either up or right, and the other two directions if they're facing left. So it's like you can exactly half predict how those enemies are going to behave took damage there on purpose to try and sneak past this bat, but it didn't work. Switch back to the... switch over to the baseball bat. Nice, uh, circular attack, but that's the only time in the run that you're gonna get to see that, so hope you enjoyed it. Good pattern there. go up in this room, you can work your way around to grab a potion, but of course it takes way too long. Potions in this game restore five hearts. You can also pick up spare hearts on the ground, and these stars that I've been picking up, if you pick up five, they'll restore a heart. And those are all of the, uh, those are all of the dropped items in this game, aside from weapons. So basically, I like to say this game's a lot like Zelda 1 when you're fighting, except you don't have a shield and you can jump. The enemies are generally much less threatening. This guy's pretty RNG heavy, but I got good RNG luck. The enemies are a lot less threatening than in a Zelda game, like Zelda 1, but any damage you take hurts a lot more. See, so yeah, what I was doing there was mashing B, not as fast as I can, but in rhythm with the shots that you, were, that you saw firing there. And doing that allows me to get uh, a one cycle on that boss. Whereas the dolphin in Crystallis lets you ride around on it, this dolphin is just going to say, Okay, thanks, bye. Good luck finding your way out of this cave. The door to the south is still shut. A big part of speedrunning this game is buffering inputs. That's just fancy talk for saying, if Mike's doing something, and you tell him on the control pad to do something else, then uh, and, and hold the button for doing that thing, 
then Mike will go ahead and start the next action as soon as he start as soon as he ends the first one on the next available frame. So for example, advancing the text, you've seen me advance pretty much every single text box as soon as it's become possible. And that's not because I'm mashing A, that's because I'm holding A and releasing it every time a text box advances briefly. Okay, so Mike Finally, finally, him not having received proper training in how to operate that submarine is caught up with him. He's crashed. Chapter 3 here is a big run killer. Basically, it's really long. There are a couple of points where you take intentional damage. And the whole point is to just not die. We could get a free life fill on that hut, but nah. Perfect pattern with these guys. Those are guys are very RNG heavy as far as which direction they choose to face every time they take a step. And now we get to the bane of my childhood, the the flying monkeys stripped straight out of Wizard of Oz, I guess. Very random. You can easily lose or gain five seconds in each one of these two rooms based on how, what kind of pattern you get. At the same time, this dungeon is very much about not taking damage, so I have to play it a little bit cautious. Full range, full range attack, these bolos that I have highlighted here. dark room there. That's just a matter of fumbling your way around. You can see the room briefly when you enter it, but that's just one example of how this game really trolls you. That was not a bad dungeon right there. It can always be better, given how much RNG there is there. Yeah, skeleton ostriches, what you're expecting. <laughs> Yeah, the world record is 105.21. I set that time nine days ago, I believe. Maybe it was another week before that. I'm just starting to learn to run Star Tropics 2. I'm not very good at that game yet. But this and Star Trek 2 are the only games that I run seriously. So now, more plot. This guy says, hey, I'll fix your ship if you go heal my daughter who is stuck sleeping eternally. So that's going to be the whole rest of this chapter. We're going to have to fight through four more dungeons just to get this guy to fix our ship after we heal his daughter up. This guy right here, he will give you some coconut milk, which will refill your life. But of course, that takes way too long. Dungeon 3-2. This one has a few spots where enemies can just pop up out of nowhere and hurt you. 
which really hurts in this chapter. I'm gonna take some intentional damage right there, because it just takes way too long to avoid all those snakes. Another dark room. First time playing this, just by sort of walking around and filming your way around, it is possible to figure out where it is safe to go, but I don't have to worry about that right now. Ah, that was the one pattern. That was like the one pattern where you're gonna get hit. Grab these hearts. Yeah, there we go. I was trying for that trick where if you press the right button on... I think you have like a two-frame window to do that trick. You can get Mike to turn around as he's entering the stairs. And doing that skips the turnaround animation for when you exit the stairs, which saves like four frames. Of course, because I messed that trick up, I lost a lot more than four frames to do that, but eh, it's fun. This is the guy, if he pops up in the wrong spot, he's gonna hit you. Didn't happen this time. Alright, boss time. This boss is really unique. You can't actually hit him. Sorry if I don't talk, I'm using this guy's noises as audio cues. There we go. First those two switches, and then he just falls into the water. Why this fire guy is hanging out in this room full of water when there are plenty of other rooms right next door that have lava in them is beyond me. Time-wise, we're doing not bad. I would like to have one more heart at this stage, but I'll take what, I'll take what I can get. Alright, so that castle right there, if you go in, you'll find that you can't actually get into the castle because you're a guy. It's, an, it's a females only affair. And this fortune teller out back tells you to go to this place to find her crystal ball which she dropped in that lake. And if you do that, she'll help you get in. Is the game volume too loud? Somebody in Skype answer that. Graveyard is has a lot of really tough enemies in it. Focus will just be on not taking too much damage. I want to end this dungeon with at least two hearts at the end. Sound is fine, chat says, okay. A lot of this game is about counting hits, like those mummies take eight hits. Invisible enemies in here. There is an item in the room before this that lets you see them, but why grab it when you can just avoid them? They do the same thing every time. Yeah, counting hits. It's a little bit difficult because there is there is a built-in delay between when you press the B button and when the yo-yo actually hits the guy. So you kind of just have to, for those mummies, hit the B button eight times and cross your fingers that they die. Because if you press the B button extra times, then Mike's just standing there firing his yo-yo at nothing and you're wasting time.
another dark room. What you're supposed to do here is go south, grab a lantern, and then that lets you see what to do in, th in this part of the room. But we're just gonna jump our way through, because we've been through this dungeon before. The enemies in here are real trolls. I want them to both appear to the right. Like that. Perfect. Oftentimes, if they appear to the left, it's extremely difficult to kill them, and you have to wait for another cycle. It's also pretty easy to get hit in there. More mummies. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. That guy didn't turn the direction I wanted him to, but oh well. making these invisible enemies visible. Those are the ones that I was avoiding in that one first room when I was talking about them. Gonna grab the mirror in this room. If you walked out that door right here without grabbing the mirror, you'd be stuck and you'd have to suicide, because the mirror is the only thing that kills these guys. Troll spawns. Just another example of how RNG can really mess up your time in this dungeon. The two mummies on the bottom of the screen right now, that started there, are the two that I don't have to kill, so I'm gonna try to keep one eye on them. Perfect. More wizards in here. <laughs> Sneaky, uh, switching to the yo-yo and back again there. That's really risky. Oftentimes I get confused as to what weapons I'm on. And here's Maxi, the ultimate RNG troll here. Just gonna move back and forth, and you gotta hope that it stays in one spot. That was not bad. That fight can go absolutely perfectly. If you watch the tasks, they just hang out on the top right corner of the screen and use RNG manipulation to get Maxi to stand right next to them, and then they just beat the crap out of them with the yo-yo. It's like I watched that and it's like, no fair, man. Alright, so jumping on this switch somehow makes all this water come down, which is actually draining the lake outside the dungeon so we can grab that crystal ball. That dungeon could have been a little bit faster, it can always be. Like the, the first room with the, the magenta wizards didn't go very well. But overall, I think the time is good so far. I finished with four hearts, which is quite good. Usually I'm hurting for life at this point. The main reason my hearts are so important is I'm about to get a weapon upgrade in the castle that I bypassed a second ago. And the way this weapon works is called the Shooting Star. It, it replaces your yo-yo while you have it. It does double damage and has longer range, so you, you really want it. It saves time versus the yo-yo pretty much everywhere. But you can only use it while you have six red hearts or more. And since we haven't been picking up any heart containers, we have exactly six hearts. So basically, the rest of this dungeon will consist of do not get hit. Because as soon as you get hit, you lose the shooting star, and then you're losing tons of time. Oh yeah, I should have explained that, thank you. Mike can't swim. <laughs> That's why I've been avoiding the water the entire time. Not only can he not swim, like, he touches the water and within like half a second he's dead. It's almost like he dissolves or something.
We're also going to talk to this lady while we're in here. She'll tell us how to get through the first room in the next dungeon. Mike's dream came true, exactly. But the dream is now ended. We could have gone to this dungeon before, but we would have been stuck. We needed the the tip from that lady in blue inside the castle as to how to get through this. She told us to jump on this button ten times and shout abracadabra, so I want everybody in chat to post that. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, abracadabra! It worked! The path opened up. Alright, so I have these hearts at the beginning so that I get the shooting star. I'm not going to be showing off the range too much because it's still at close range works like the yo-yo. If you fire at point blank range, the firing animation is still shorter. It won't be until a little bit later in the game that I'll actually take advantage of the, the range of this thing. There we go, I see a nice wall of abracadabras in the chat. I also see lots of other things <laughs> that kind of sound like... What is it? All of a sudden we're doing the Pokemon rap in channels, how it goes? Alright, this dungeon is a real run killer. Like I said, you can't get hit, otherwise you're losing tons of time. And there are plenty of enemies that will try very hard to hit you. Sending into hell again? Okay, this room. I hate this room so much. You'll see why. These random enemies are so bad! Ah! <laughs> Phew, lucky. Grave Licker, thank you. I'm trying to reach out as much as I can, but it's quite difficult. Not much downtime in these dungeons at all. We run in place on this tile that's supposed to help make these uh, guys spawn a little bit quicker. Kappa? Those guys are sort of Kappa. I mean, the guy in this room right here is more Kappa because he's actually in the water. Oh no, I killed Kappa. Kappa stab Z. This guy was gonna run around. He takes six hits with the shooting star, but 11 with the yo yo, so there's a huge time difference there. Again, counting the hits. If I press B only five times, I'll take damage. If I press B seven times, I'll fire an extra shot and just kind of stand there. This right here, that's a new strat for this room that I just came up with last night. So yeah, still minor details uh, being worked out in this game. As you could imagine, a lot, of, a lot of the rooms have their routes pretty much set in stone. But every now and then, it's just you find a little tweak that saves like maybe a tenth of a second, which what is what that saves. Oh, stab Z, stab Z is dead now. That's too bad.
Run, run, hurry, hurry. What passageway are we running through right now? Why didn't we use this passageway to get to that guy in the first place? That guy, by the way, gave us this magic scroll. It's gonna wake this girl up. So that this complete user guy here can heal our ship for us. I'm hungry. Put down that banana cream pie. Yeah, this game is a thing with bananas. I don't understand. Okay, excuse me. I, I, don't, I don't claim to be a, a Kappa expert. <laughs> Alright, Chapter 3 is done. No major issues there. Time's looking good so far, I think. I don't have the, the stream open, so I have no idea what the time is. I don't have splits open either. Alright, Chapter 4. This is the worst chapter in the game. Dark Terex, if he's watching, will attempt to convince you otherwise, but sorry, this chapter is stupid. So we talk to this one guy, who tells us that there's some guy on our raft looking for us, and he's to the east, so we'll go to the east. All of a sudden, whale. Yes. The entire rest of this chapter will consist of breaking out of this whale. And no, there is no dungeon inside of it. There's no fights inside Lord Jabu Jabu's belly today. Here's this guy. We, we talked to him briefly in chapter one. He's all, hey, your uncle got abducted by aliens, which we already knew. So yeah, thanks for nothing. So that guy tells us that we're gonna we're gonna bust out of here Pinocchio style and light his raft on fire. Except he somehow lost his lighter when he ended up inside here. Good job. So and of course the lighter is in like the very farthest part away inside of this whale that we can possibly get to. out to the music because there's nothing to talk about. Pointless whale, pointless whale, pointless whale is pointless. Almost there. One more screen. There we go. That fish right there. The moment he got swallowed by this whale and was slowly dying, he was staring at this lighter thinking, What is that? I always just thought that was interesting. Fortunately, there's this one-way dive point right here, which will let us shortcut back to the raft. Right there. You've built a fire. Mike, help! I've got smoke in my eyes! Yeah, thanks. <laughs> this next part is a really cool part of the game. He's gonna... Uh, the robot inside the submarine is gonna tell you to input the code. And what you're supposed to do, there was like a actual letter from your uncle that came with a copy of this game. This guy will tell you what you're supposed to do is dip that letter in water, and when you do, some like invisible ink will show up and tell you that the code are the infamous number 747. Good, I didn't mess up typing in the code. Otherwise you have to type in the whole thing again. And yeah, chapter 4 is over. That's it, really. Chapter 5, okay. Long story short, we want to go north, but that giant ship is blocking us, so the entire chapter will be... Mission, uh, sink the ship. And unfortunately, there's, there's quite a bit of overall movement that you have to do here before you can actually get into the next dungeon. That's kind of the weird thing about this game, is like... Early on, there are a couple of RNG heavy points, like the, the, the boss in Chapter 2, the giant octopus, the whole graveyard is very RNG heavy. The first dungeon in Chapter 3 is RNG heavy. 
But once you get past Chapter 3, all of a sudden there's this really big... This really big, uh, boring spot, so to say, because there's not a whole lot that can go on before- go wrong before the end of Chapter 3, and really the start of Chapter 6. Chapter- the dungeon in this chapter, there is not very much RNG in it, it's just a matter of getting through it without making any mistakes. The dungeon in this chapter, by the way, is my personal favorite when you're playing casually. The result- it's not so much about killing enemies as it is about, like, dodging pitfalls and stuff, and it's just really cool to watch, I think. So once again, an another town, another guard that won't let you pass until you talk to almost everybody. That one lady in red down below me is the only, only person in this village that I don't have to talk to. So I kind of went out of the way and got that worm from that fisherman you see in my inventory there without really explaining it. Basically, this guy is going to tell us, go sink the ship and go in the dungeon to do that. But the only way that you can sink the ship is by getting a hint from this parrot, which is to the west of the village. But the parrot, being a jerk, won't help you until you give it a present, maybe a little worm. So that's what we're doing here. He says the immortal words, do me so far, do me. Which means the parrot has been spending way too much time in the captain's bedroom. Wait, no. It means that we have to type in those musical notes, do me so fa do me, into this piano, giant piano, which is really, really it's an organ, which is in a, a building that I'm going towards right now. first time playing through. Let's see if I can not mess up typing the notes onto the keyboard, because I've done that before during a run, and it does kill the run. Good, no mess ups today. Picnic, what? We're back? Okay. Can someone in the Skype chat tell me what happened and if I need to change anything? Wait, are we gone again? It, kill it would kill the run because that not only would I have to type in the code again, but... The game won't accept the code once you've messed up until you leave the building and walk back back in. So it wastes like 20 seconds, which is way too much to waste. I'm good? Okay. So yeah, pitfalls. Random spears flying at you, tiles that disappear, it's all fun. I'm going to hit this silver ball as soon as possible so that I don't have to wait for very long right now. I'm taking this weird path through this room because there are spots where you'll just fall through the floor. Only have to kill the bat in this room. This kind of the weird thing about this game is you have to sort of memorize everything, like which enemies you have to kill in certain rooms. It takes a while to learn, but I played this game as a kid for a whole bunch, so 
memorizing things like that, I didn't have to do too much work. I'd already memorized a lot of the game. Bowling ball hype. Yeah, totally not an Indiana Jones ripoff. Because this bowling ball is cognizant and rolls in both directions. They didn't have that. Grabbing those mirrors, not because of the enemies in this room, which I don't actually have to kill, but there are enemies like them later on. There's another opportunity to grab mirror, grab mirrors again, but this one just happens to be more convenient. We only had to kill the bat in that last room. You only have to kill the snakes in this room. So yeah, it's kind of just ra random decisions on the game maker's part as far as what you have to kill. Another bowling ball. There is a kamikaze strike you can do right here, where you hit the bowling ball on like a one or two frame window, and it lets you walk past it instead of waiting at that last spot like I did there. And that saves like half a second if you get it, but if you miss it, you die instantly. So, no surprise that I didn't go for it there. Damage boosting through those, those guys because it just takes too long to constantly jump over them. I'm gonna skip these hearts because I have enough. Time I run through this room so that I get aligned with this sinking tile. Last bowling ball. This one's a little more self-aware than the last two. It'll actually chase you a bit. I'm gonna push how many times I have to hit that one more to the absolute limit. There we go. Ah. Those guys disappear a little bit quicker than their magenta counterparts in the graveyard, so. That's why that shot didn't land. Running through the room, jumping on the tile, which makes a thing disappear and water flow. And gears, yay, everybody likes gears. No, what's really happening is the, the ship is filling up with water. I think we're on the ship, that's what's up with those wooden tiles on the top, I'm not really sure. The song may or may not be God Save the Queen or My Country Tis of Thee. It's up to you to decide. <laughs> Mike is American, but the captain of that ship the game says was British, so your choice. Alright, it's chapter 6 time. There's quite a bit of overworld before we get to the dungeons, but the two dungeons in this, dungeons in this chapter are my personal favorites for speedrunning, because they have the, really the most technical rooms in them. If you're curious, down those stairs is another heart container. Another warp around here takes you into a chamber that looks like it's going to have a heart container in it, but instead it has a big apple. Yes, apple. And when you pick it up, the text box is literally, you got a big apple. It's delicious, but nothing happens, so it's just a complete troll. 
Zelma. Although it's, it's not quite as good of a troll as the, the Chicken Nuggets in Star Tropics 2. Look up a video of that game if you're curious. So yeah, now all of a sudden our robot friend is shouting out coordinates. Like right, right now he's about to say, go east one space. And now we're done. So now we'll just dive down. Appreciate these sprites because they're not used anywhere else in the game. Hardest dungeon right here. It's getting darker. Run, Mike! Run! Run faster! Oh, thank god I made it. Okay, so that, that was the, the zeroth dungeon in Chapter 6. Okay, now the real fun begins. This one dungeon. If it wasn't for the trolley RNG bosses, this would be my favorite dungeon in the game. Let's get the shooting star back. Pink and blue mummies. That's bad. That one blue mummy saw me. When it wasn't supposed to, to be honest. And I had to suddenly invent some new backup strats. I like that about this game, though. You can plan routes through, a, through most of the rooms, where the enemies don't move really randomly. But every now and then something goes wrong, and you have to come up with a backup strat very quickly. Best room in the game right here, the conga line room. Perfect. Alright, worst boss in the game right here. This is Turboss. He's just a reskin of the giant octopus in Chapter 2. And he gave me good RNG for once. Usually he will stay up there for forever. And if he hits you, then you automatically lose the shooting star and then you're just screwed. Pew! I love that sound glitch, it happens very rarely. You just jump on a switch and all of a sudden it plays a different sound. Turboss. Turd boss without the D. Because <laughs> he's supposed to be shaped like a turbocharger, I guess? This game was released in 1990, so I guess the whole world was still a little bit turbo crazy. Fleets, so OP. This is the only dungeon I get to see, him, see them in, though, unfortunately. I also picked up some baseballs. Those are only used for the boss. They don't actually don't hurt anything else, for some bizarre reason. Please don't get hit. Good. I think I have the correct timing in this room. It's quite difficult to get. Hit you, hit you. And then if I did it right, I can sneak past this fireball. Perfect. This room's cool. You have to jump to every single space. So your normal advantage over the mummies, which is that you're faster than them, is removed. If you don't take them out quickly, you'll find that you're very quickly surrounded by them. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you... Obama. That's right, we're gonna fight Obama. And if he's kind, he'll give us a one cycle. Got it. Thanks, Obama. I was gonna say blame Obama if anything went wrong, but nope, we're gonna thank Obama this time. Or 
more underground passageway stuff. Now we come to this rock, which the game doesn't tell you what it is yet, but it's actually an alien race's escape pod that landed here. And we'll reveal more about that after this dungeon. The start of this dungeon is the ultimate troll. You don't go up. It's a dead end. You have to figure out to walk through the wall and go right. It's kind of silly. Every now and then in a run, I forget and go up, and then it's just like, dang it. Now we're going to get one of the coolest weapons in the game, the throwing stars. They do that, <laughs> to put it shortly. You're going to see me constantly switching between the shooting star and the throwing stars. Okay, now which one is more convenient to use? That room, with those bubbles, those are the bubbles from Zelda 1, so if they touch you, you can't use any weapons for 5 seconds. Not not just your sword like in Zelda 1, but any weapons at all, you can't use for 5 seconds, so that's really a pain. Just completely wreck that boss. Across the room are invincible until they reappear. I make that guy spawn on the top row because the top row is a little bit shorter. It'll show up later. Good RNG in this room. I got both guys to appear right away. Then I almost screwed up. Then I did screw it up. Oh well. We're still doing pretty good on time, I think. Okay, I tried to turn... That's bad. I tried to turn left, but the game said, Oh, you pressed left for one more frame than you were supposed to. We're gonna make you walk left. And I walked right into that guy. That would be a huge problem. You see, I've lost the, the shooting star. But fortunately, potion! Which I'm sort of forced to walk through. It's not any faster to avoid it. So we'll just use that and be on our way. If I get a good pattern here, this will look really cool. Nope. If I get a good pattern there, I'll, like, be standing right next to the second guy and racking up all the hits very quickly. It's really tense, because if you mess up one of the hits, he'll touch you, and then that's insta-kill. Don't you love it when games make bosses that are specifically designed for a certain weapon that you have? Alright, so a bit of an overworld section now. We're about to run into our uncle who has decided to camp out down here for some bizarre reason. And he'll fill in the rest of the plot. Basically, Zoda, who's like the evil final boss of the game, is trying to exterminate all the Argonians. And the Argonians only have a few people left, so they sent their last escape pod with three magic cubes in it to Earth. And your job is to now go to the evil aliens and take back the three magic cubes which they have stolen from that escape pod which we saw before this last dungeon. At some point, Dr. Jones is going to ask us if he wants us to repeat the story right now. And make sure to pick no, <laughs> otherwise you lose 10 seconds.
Okay, so now we come to dungeon 7-1. This is the absolute run killer. There is no guarantee that I will make it through this level without dying. There is no guarantee that I will make it through this level without game overing. You just have to get lucky. Unless you plan to just waste a minute fighting a whole bunch of enemies. Basically, the main reason for that is all the levels that you've seen so far have been really linear. This one is not, but we're going to treat it linearly. So instead of grabbing all the power-ups that'll make this level a little bit easier, we're just going to try to make a dash straight for the exit, and that's quite difficult. That guy can sometimes hit you. Luckily, he didn't. Nice remix of the overworld, or the, the dungeon theme, by the way. Sneak past that guy. Sneak past these guys. Ow. Ow. I made it. Somehow. But I still have to get through this part. This part's also quite hard. Made it! That was the one part that I was dreading. Is dying in those last two rooms. I have made it through. This is good. Alright, these bosses, you want to try and fight them from bottom to top. I'm not doing a very good job, I'm getting hit too much. Okay, they're dead. That, that I took a little bit too much damage there, but we're okay. There's quite a few hearts that you can refill on at the beginning of the next dungeon. This might be world record pace? I really don't know. I don't have my splits up or timers up anywhere. I haven't had any huge mistakes so far, aside from running into that one purple dude in the last dungeon in Chapter 6. Alright, so now we found the first magic cube. This one is going to give us a weapon upgrade. So similar to how you need to have at least 6 hearts to use the shooting star, you need to have at least 11 hearts, that's the full top row, in order to use this supernova. Which will do 1.5 time, times damage as the shooting star, so 3 times more than the yo-yo. But it has full screen range, so it's just completely OP. The world record is 1 hour, 5 minutes, and 21 seconds. Nice. This dungeon basically has a whole bunch of life refills, so I'm going to take it extremely risky with trying to jump past enemies, and I'll occasionally get hit like I did there. Nice. I somehow managed to avoid getting hit by that guy. Those green space guys, they're really random in their movements. If you play the game long enough, it's, you start to develop a little bit of an instinct on, what, on when they're going to do what, but frequently that instinct is wrong, so for the most part you just have to get lucky. Best upgrade in the game right here, steroids. Mike's going to have a hard time passing his next drug test. He is a baseball pitcher in real life. So, I didn't get to show it off for very long because I took a bunch of hits there, but it refills your health past maximum to two full rows. And then it's supposed to slowly drain back to your normal maximum, but... I took a bunch of hits there, so, nope. Tractor beam didn't troll me, that's good. Mini boss time. This orange gun that I picked up right here, it does the most damage in the game. And it's unique in the sense that its uh, width is bigger than just one pixel. So that means you can use it to stand outside of an enemy's line of fire while you can hit them. That's something that you'll very much wish you had throughout the rest of the game. You 
see I just fired off an extra shot so that I only have two ammo of this gun left. That's because I'm about to do a strat for this boss in the next room that's due to Nudua. Shoutouts to Nudua. That requires me to hit this guy twice and then to switch to the supernova. So because I ran out of that item, ah, you jerk. Get back there. I almost got the quick kill on Osteroid, but he decided to be a jerk and jump back forward. Yeah, I, I wanted to switch from the Orge Gun to the Supernova after firing it twice, so the fact that I ran out of it there means I don't have to worry about moving my uh, thumb over to select. See, so yeah, I, I got hit a few times that dungeon, I had to pick up a few life refills that I might have skipped if this was a really good dungeon. But overall, overall, nothing terrible happened, I guess, so I guess we're still doing okay. There we go, I thought somebody would post that. This is, this is the part where Darkwing Duck, when he was running this game, would traditionally sing overly long maze-like hallways. I can't sing like him, though, so I won't. Chapter 8 is 102.12. I have no idea what my world record split at Chapter 8 is. I still have no idea how I'm doing. So yeah, the second magic cube fills up our life right now, so it was very important for me to finish that last dungeon with as much health as I as possible, I actually finish it with full life. That way that animation doesn't with, with the hearts filling it doesn't take quite as long. It takes roughly one second to fill up each heart. Alright, so the spaceship has decided to take off. They figure we'll just turn off the oxygen after a while and Michael suffocate and that'll be the end of him. Last chapter, final battle. Uh, contrary to what this says, um, the battle that I'm about to walk into is not the final battle. There's a little bit of dungeon after that. But the, the battle that I'm about to walk into is the infamous RNG part of the run. Basically, we're going to fight the first form of Zoda and he will randomly spawn either a giant head or a giant hand. If he spawns a head, you can hurt him. If he spawns a hand, you can't. It's a 50-50 shot. So, everybody cross your fingers and hope for no hands. Just like a Mario 3 run, I guess. That's a hand. That's bad. You lose four seconds per hand. There's another four seconds. There's another four seconds. This game is absolutely brutal because there's this RNG heavy part that heavy at the end of the game. Okay, that's five hands in a row. That's quite bad. Six. <laughs> the most hands anybody's ever documented getting is, I believe, 13 by Darkwing Duck. Eight hands- oh my god, what the heck? Stop! No! Ten hands before the first head. You saw that I only hit him once there? That's because... Y you can hit him with the ray gun multiple times each time the head appears, but only the first shot does damage for some bizarre reason. That's 11. That's 12. That is 13. Guess what? McAfee's trying to restart my computer again. That's 14! Guys, it's a new world record of the wrong kind. <laughs> that is the most hands I believe anybody has ever documented getting in the first phase fight. Also, the reason why it took a little bit of time walking out of that door is because I was trying to tell McAfee to shut up. Alright, there's a little bit of a hallway bit here. the actual final fight. 
I can afford to lose a few hearts here, so I'm gonna be playing it pretty risky fighting the enemies in this part. I'm curious to see what the end time is, like whether the- just how much did those hands cost? That was 14 hands, so we lost 56 seconds. Trying to get the one cycle on this guy. Got it. If you don't kill that guy quickly enough, the little yellow walls will form up around him, and then he'll regenerate some health and you'll have to wait an extra cycle. Meanwhile, there's all sorts of things trying to kill you. So I got lucky there. Alright, final fight time. There is a glitch that can happen here, these little alien things that you saw right there. If Zoda does not spawn... Okay, he spawned two of them, so I don't think the glitch will happen. But if he hadn't, once I kill Zoda, the game would have sort of skipped most of the ending of the game. So for that reason, the timer stops the instant Zoda starts his death animation, so time will be coming up pretty soon here. Time! What was the time? Somebody post. One oh six oh two. Oh my god. Zoda literally stole world record by a lot. So if I had had the average luck, which is four hands, actually maybe he didn't. If I had the average luck, which is four hands, because it's a 50-50 shot and you have to hit him four times, I would have that would have been 10 hands less, so 40 seconds difference. Which would have put me at 105.22, which is one second off the world record. So, aside from the awful RNG at the very end, this was a really good run. It could have gone much worse. All of a sudden, plot twist. Mike can swim! He can swim! You dirty liar. You said you couldn't swim. Oh, never mind. And yeah. Cheesy ending. Dolphin saves you. Okay, so the timer I stopped, we're gonna go ahead and play through the ending, because why not? This whole part that I'm playing through right now would have been skipped over if the glitch had happened during the final boss fight. Say again? So technically, if that glitch wouldn't have okay, existed, hello? you'd still be in control here, so this would have been part of the timer, but yeah. We cut it out just so that you don't have to slow down during the final boss fight to try and keep the glitch from happening. That would be silly. The pig is gone, exactly. <laughs> but wait, we're not done yet. You have to play the world's shortest game of cube. No, you don't. We join the three magic cubes, which make the most annoying sound ever. What? What's echoing? Is something echoing? It can't be echoing. What's echoing? I pulled up the Twitch video for a second, but it's muted. It couldn't possibly be echoing. Was it really echoing? I don't know how that happened. Alright. Enjoy the awesome ending music. Which you would not have gotten if the glitch had happened.
Oh, someone else's audio. Okay. Weird. And yeah, right now is where we would have skipped to if the ending glitch had happened with this slideshow right here. Hopefully we can uh, stay on just a little bit longer because we got to we got to see Mike with the bananas in his ears. That's what you've all been hyped for, I'm sure. Hey, thanks by Green Dolphin was there. He was there briefly. I am really impressed by the art as well. You can see little bits of sprites everywhere that are reused from the game. I'd be interested to know how they packed all these pictures into the NES. Almost there. Almost there. Yes! Bananas. Thank you all for watching. We've got Battle of Olympus next. Zelda 1 and Zelda 2 are still to come, so stick around.